All right, here we go. Uh, today, Jesus is speaking to a bunch of religious leaders uh, who the problem with them is not their power and their position, but it's their posture. And, uh, and so Jesus is trying to help them understand that if you want to invest spiritually in somebody's life, you have to have the right posture. And, uh, and these guys were all about power. And so he's saying, if you wanna make a difference, if you wanna be a first church champion, if you wanna lead others in their faith, you have to be willing to be stretched. And so here's how it goes down. And, and I'm gonna be in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, but this is the conversation that he has with the religious guys. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to get you one. Uh, you can grab one on the way out. If you have a Bible app, open it up. If you have a, a physical Bible, open this as well. We believe this is God's truth. We believe it is the narrative and the script for our lives. And it's why we stand for it. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up and he wanted to test Jesus. He said, teacher, what must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I want you to know if your approach to God is asking what you can do to gain eternal life, you have missed the point of the cross. God has already done it for you. You just need to receive his grace. Come on, somebody, let's celebrate that this morning. He said, uh, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? And the man said, you gotta love the Lord your God with your heart, with your soul, with your strength, and with your mind. And you gotta love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, congratulations, golf clap, you have answered correctly. And then he said, do this and you will live. I want you to know that you will experience life in its fullness the moment that you love Jesus with everything that you have. So Jesus, uh, teacher, they're kind of going at it again. And uh, the religious leader says to him, so who's my neighbor? Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho where he was attacked by a robber. They stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. Next sentence, a priest. Who is Jesus speaking to? A priest. He says a priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man and he passed by him on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to this place, saw him and passed him on the other side. Now you can feel the fury in the priest's eyes. He's like, he's getting really upset with Jesus. And then Jesus offends him even more. He says, a Michigan fan. No. No. This was, a, this was kind of a, this was, this is kind of a way of putting somebody down. They said, but a Samaritan, a Michigan fan had traveled and he came where the man was and he saw him and he took pity on him and he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to him and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said to him, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense. Jesus says, which of the three, which of the three was a neighbor to this man? The expert said, the one who had mercy the one who had mercy. Jesus says, do it, just do it, just do it. The title of my message today, oh, is it time to stretch? It's time to stretch. Uh, I really like my second title for this message, which is stretch yourself, stretch yourself. So turn to somebody, turn to three people on the way down and say, stretch yourself. Oh, it's going to be a good day. So uh, whenever, I want you to know, whenever I'm preaching, uh, my goal is to give you practical application for your life. That's it. I want you to walk away with a takeaway. Sometimes it has to do with your faith and sometimes it has nothing to do with your faith at all. And so today I want to speak to my guys starting out. Where are my guys in the room? That's it. Watch this, guys. Hey, where are my ladies in the room? Let's try it again. All right, guys, where are you? Oh, I could feel the hair building off your chest as you gave that scream. So good. So good. Um, 
But here's what I want to teach you, men. And ladies, you're going to thank me for this. Today, in this message, I want to teach you how to properly apply cologne on your body. Okay? By the way, to be clear, this is not cologne, nor does this sit in my shelf. But I want to teach you this because it's really important because some of you are still learning. So here are the three rules. You ready? You ready for this? You spray, you delay, and you walk away. <laughs> That's it. Should we do it again so you can remember? Say it with me now, man. Spray, delay, walk away. Everybody now, because some of you need to tell your husbands this, we spray, we delay, and we walk away. See, see, what some of you haven't figured out yet is that you, you spray, and bro, you just stay. Oh, smells so good. I want everybody that I hug today to smell like me. You ever met these people? See, you're thinking about them right now. See, you, you know that person, they don't even have to be in the room and you know where they've been. Right? And I feel bad. Can I, can I just talk with my, my middle school students and my high school students, more so my middle school students? If you have a middle schooler, you understand this. Let's go there for just a minute. But see, we always give them a hard time for smelling bad because they haven't figured out how to shower yet. But then we give them a hard time when they try to cover it up. Either way, you still stink. Just take a shower, guys. That's all you got to do. But I was thinking about this. Like, we fault them. We fault them for smelling bad, and yet we haven't even shown them how to apply cologne yet. And, and Old Spice, by the way, does not do a very good job of this either, because, because on the can, it says underarm spray and body spray. Like, if they just wanted you to spray your wrist, it would say wrist spray. If they just wanted you to spray behind your ears, they'd say behind your ear spray. If they wanted you to spray other areas that we can't mention, we can't mention or put on this bottle because it would be inappropriate, they would put it here. But instead, they put body spray. And my favorite part is on the back, they give our teenagers instructions. Can we get a picture of this? It's not working. It's not working. Uh, if you could look at my little bottle, it says shake. And then it has another picture of a dude with six-pack abs pointing this thing at himself, I'm not going to do it. Just bath, just all over his body. And then it's so cool. It's got a bicep with a boat in the middle of it when you're done. <laughs> Can you fault the kids? Instructions are right here. Spray and stay. Kids, spray, delay, and walk away. But, but here's what I know. Like, like, you know that person. You're thinking of that student. Like, you walk down the hall and you're like, Billy's here. You've gone to the restaurant, you're like, yeah, my dad's here. Man, when I, when I used to go to the gym, there was this trainer, and I could never figure out what cologne he was wearing, and so I'd just walk around the gym like a little creeper. Like, he wasn't even in the room. I was like, I know he's here. But I would walk around trying to figure out what scent does he use because I want to use it. It smells so good. And what I know is he wasn't even in the room, but I knew exactly where he'd been. And church, I don't know about you, but in my life, not necessarily with my clone, but when it comes to my faith, when I leave this world, I want everyone to know exactly where I've been. You want that too? You want that too? In your life, when you leave this world, I'm guessing because you have big faith, you want people to know exactly where you've been. And I want to say it this way. Uh, I want to leave a legacy that lives beyond me. I want to leave a legacy that lives beyond me. Um, I want you to know this. Uh, my legacy is not about a platform. It is not about a mic. It is not about followers. It's not about shares. It's not even what you think of me. Can I let you know? I love you very much, but I also don't really care what you think about me. I'm going to be me. I'm going to do what I want to do. But here's what I know is that that in my own life, I've come to this realization that it has nothing to do with my platform, but it's the gifts that God has put in front of me. It's the things that God has given me to steward. And so I realized that one of the greatest callings in my life, the greatest way that I can leave a legacy is through these two beautiful boys in my family that he has given me. And so for my own life, I have this document. And if you go through Hope Discovered, you would do this too. You write these I am statements for your life. 
And, and here's what I write, and here's what I read every week over my own life. I write, I'm called as a father to Carter and Miles. My greatest investment in the leg is the legacy I leave through them. I will not always have the church, but I will always have my family. And I will be the father to my two boys. Brad, your greatest impact in the world is not in who you become, but it's in who they become. And so I will commit as a father to raise my boys to love Jesus and lead bigger lives than I could ever dream of. That is my calling in this life. And I realize that God has given me and he has entrusted me these two beautiful lives. And the only thing that I can give that will leave a legacy is to teach them to love God with all of their heart, with all of their passion, with all of their mind, and with all of their soul. If I can teach them just to do that, then my name doesn't have to be known because I know that the name of Jesus is going to be carried throughout every generation that it is passed down to their kids and their kids and their kids. And and God gets all the glory because we have decided to invest in the thing that is in front of us, church. I want to leave a legacy that lives beyond me. But here's what I also know about you. And here's what I know about. Maybe you thought about this. You live, you live on the other side of somebody else's legacy. For good or for bad. You live on the other side of someone else's legacy. Like, 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 can I say it this way? Like the reason you're sitting in a church today is because there was a group of people who passed down a legacy. Uh, some of you, think about it this way. Some of you, uh, you looked at your parents' relationship and you remember that it was emotionally unhealthy. For some of you, you watched parents and, and they were abusive to each other. And when they split, you blame yourself and you thought it's my fault, it's my fault that the relationship is messed up, but you live on the other side of that and now you have a marriage and now you have a relationship and you're wondering, how do I do this thing? I can't figure it out and it's not your fault. It's just the example that's been given to you. Can I say this to my, my students? Can I say this to you guys? You live on the other side of your friend's legacy. The people you choose to surround your life with, oh, that will set your legacy forever. See, it might be fun right now just to go party and hang out, maybe have a drink or two and do things that we know we shouldn't do. That's fun. But you know what's not fun is when you're 30 and the rest of your friends have professions, they have careers, they're doing something with their life and you're still in the basement snorting coke. Oh, is that too much? Like you are living on the other side of your friend's legacy. Let's, let's talk about it in a good way. Uh, the other day I was riding with Janelle, I was telling her about this message because I get really fired up about my messages. I'm really just fired up about Jesus. So if you think I'm mad, I'm always just passionate, okay? But Daniel said, my, my, my grandmother was not a Christian. And my grandmother, uh, years ago, her marriage was a wreck. And somebody told her, if you just give your life to Jesus, that'll all change. And so she went to her husband, Keith, and she said, you know what? Hey, if you want to stay married to me, get on your knees and talk to this Jesus guy. And he did. And every day after that, she poured God's word into her daughter's life. Every day she read scripture. Every day she put that script. Every day she put that word on her daughter's life. And you know what she did? She passed it down to my wife. Her mom, Janelle's mom, every day because her mom did it, poured scripture on her life every single day. That was a legacy that was passed down because somebody knew that when they were gone, oh, there was something more to them than just their name. And church, can I, can I tell you this today, that, that you want people to know where you've been when you're gone. You want people to know where you've been, but you have to leave a legacy that lives beyond you. And I wanna give you a little secret today. And the secret is this, your legacy begins when you love God with all that you are. You're not feeling that comment. You're like, I know, preacher boy, you have to say it because it's in the Bible. Well, let me, let me say it this way. Uh, Jesus said it this way. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What are you saying is you will try to leave a legacy on your own, but you're always going to try to do it with your own strength. And when you do it on your own strength, you're going to always come up short. 
But he said, if you, if, you, if you remain in me, if you abide in me, if you love me, he said, I will remain in you. I will live in you and you will leave and you will make a change in this world that is beyond what you can dream of. Scripture says it this way. He says, commit to the Lord, commit to the Lord, commit to the Lord. You say it now, commit to the Lord, commit to the Lord. I'm going to believe you in a minute. Commit to the Lord. He says, commit to the Lord. Love him with all that you are, and he will establish your purpose in life. He will establish your purpose in life. See, see, what I know is this, is that when you love God with all your heart, church, oh, when you love God with all of your heart, your eternity changes today. When you love God with all of your mind, I want you to know that your intellect is not the ceiling of your impact, but you will do things in life that will defy all understanding of the people around you. See, when you love God with all of your soul, church, what I know is that you will not walk aimlessly through this life, but you will live with meaningful purpose throughout this life. When you love God with all of your strength, church, what I know is that you are given a power that is unrecognizable when it comes to the human life. My kid the other day, we're reading Acts chapter four, and he says to me, he said, dad, why when the Holy Spirit shows up, did the disciples act all crazy? Why when, the, why, why when the Holy Spirit shows up, do they start doing things that everybody hates? Because when God shows up in your life and you love him with everything you are, guess what? You become more bold. You become more courageous. You become unafraid. You are fearless. You proclaim the good news. You tell the story unashamedly. You let everyone you know around you what God has done in your life. And you are unafraid to share the gospel and the grace and the love and the mercy and how he has restored and shaped who you are, church. See, God, with all that you are, you have a purpose, you have a passion, you have a skill set, you have a future, and you know that God is taking you somewhere that you could not go on your own, but you know that you'll leave a legacy in the end. Can we celebrate that 11 a.m.? Come on, come on. You can't let the 9 a.m. beat you. Can I tell you, 9 a.m. got rowdy this morning. They were rowdy. You're going to get there. I'll show you something in the story today. Verse 33. It says this, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured on oil and wine. And then he put on the man, his on his own donkey, and he brought him to the inn, and he took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, Look after him. I love this. And he said, when I return, when I return, he said, I will re reimburse you for all the extra expenses. So in this story, uh, I want to ask you this one question. Who is the unlikely hero? Who's the unlikely hero? Some of you aren't answering because you know this is a trick question. <laughs> if you've been in church your whole life and you've read the Bible, you say, Samaritan. Can I just tell you, if you know who it is, he's not unlikely anymore. Okay, can I make the argument today that the person that Jesus was talking about was the innkeeper? The one who had mercy was the innkeeper. The one who was going to leave a legacy was the innkeeper. I'm, I'm so interested in what the innkeeper looked like, and I know you are too. So uh, there's this wonderful painting of, of Rem, that Rembrandt made, and this is of the innkeeper. So if we could zoom in real quick on the innkeeper. Man, look at his face. He's intense. He's like, I know it's about to go down and it's not going to be good. And you brought me a half dead body. What am I supposed to do? And I thought, man, this is a beautiful masterpiece. And then my five-year-old self decided to show up because in this picture, there is also another masterpiece that is being made. <laughs> oh, I, I have no words. Other than to say, I still find this stuff funny. Do you? <laughs> Highly inappropriate. I don't care. Rembrandt, put it in there. <laughs> but, I, but I think what the dog is doing is a metaphor for what's about to happen. He's like, bro, it's about to go down. <laughs> Too much for you? But think about this with me for a minute. 
I'm about to tell you something that you've never heard. I'm going to tell you something revolutionary. Ready for this? The innkeeper is an innkeeper. No, I'm not going to drop it. The innkeeper is an innkeeper. The innkeeper is not a medic. And yet what we find in the story is there's a Samaritan who brings this half-dead body, this half-broken person, this person who was laid on the side of the road so he was supposed to die. And he shows up to the innkeeper and says, listen, man, I know you check people in. I know you give them the cards to get through their room. I know that you give them bills when they leave. I know that you, uh, you change bed sheets, but I need you to transition. I need you to go from changing sheets to changing bandages. I need you to hook up IVs. I need you to put medications together, put a little cocktail together to help this man's pain. I need you to move from being an innkeeper to being something that you never thought you would be. Church, can, can, I, can I show you in the story? See, see, God is helping this man see his potential, but the only way that he can reach this man's life is when he is stretched. It's when he's stretched. See, God has, to, God has to put an uncomfortable situation in your life so you can be stretched. He puts this broken man in the innkeeper's face as a way to say, bro, I have given you gifts, I've given you skills, I've given you things, I've given you passion that you haven't even discovered yet. And the only way that I can pull it out of you, what I put in you, is to put you in a really hard circumstance. I'm going to say it this way. Sometimes we'd be sitting on what we've been given. Sometimes you and I are sitting on gifts and talents and skills that God has given us. We're just sitting on it because we don't like to be. Let me, let me put it this way. You're going you're to get there. So never done this before. But today, we got, it always begins with a rubber glove. For some of you, this means something else. All right, here we go. But when I was a kid, I would go to this pizza place in Troy, Ohio called Noble Romans. Some of you know. And uh, one of my favorite things about Noble Romans wasn't the pizza. I'm sure it was just average. But I remember as a kid, they had a stairwell that you would go up and there was a platform there. Are you with me? And there's a huge window. And in the window, uh, they would make pizzas there. And my favorite part was to watch them take the dough and then spin it around. So much fun. Here's what I never saw. I never saw a pizza maker. What do you call a pizza maker? A pizza maker. I never saw a pizza maker take the dough and go, oh, let's just put some pepperonis on this. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, uh, can we give Nate a hand? If you're watching online today, would you give Nate a hand? He's behind this camera. He's on our hope team. He does an amazing job. But I've never seen anybody make a pizza when it's in a ball. Like, what would happen if I put sauce on this? It would roll off. I don't care if you put white sauce, red sauce, green sauce, salsa. It would just fall off. But, but here's the thing. I've never seen anybody do this. This is like a calzone, isn't it? It's kind of disgusting. But the other thought is this, is, is you can't have pizza without all this goodness. I've never met anybody who says, I really love eating pizza dough. <laughs> what pizza do you like? Just the dough? Never met anybody like that. See, see what makes a pizza good is, is the things that go on top. It's the pepperonis, it's the mushrooms, it's the onions, it's, it's whatever you like. You like sausage, you like meat lovers, you like the extreme, whatever you like, like that's what makes a pizza good. It's all the goodings, it's the gifts, right? But how do you get there? You can't do it when it's a ball. It's got to be what? It's got to be what? Right? Have you ever watched somebody stretch a ball of dough? In fact, I wonder if a dough had a brain, I wonder what it would say. In fact, I want you to give me the script as we do this. I wonder what it would say. How do we start? doing 
that to me. Stop it. Some of you, like, this is what you sound like when you get out of bed every day. <laughs> ah! Oh! It's painful. You got to be stretched. In fact, I wonder, I wonder what the dough would say when we get to this point. Say it now. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> no. He's saying it. He is not saying, woo. <laughs> He's saying, no. <laughs> Scream it with me. No. There you go. Let's do it one more time. <laughs> it's painful. Let's get this off. This is greasy. It's painful. It's painful, but you can't have a pizza you can't have the goodness on it until it's, Stretch. until it's, Stretch. oh, come on, church. What you have to understand is sometimes God is trying to pull out of you what he has put in you. But the only way that he can pull out of you what he's put in you is for you to be stretched. See, sometimes God has put a circumstance on your life that is uncomfortable. And the only way that he can get out of you what's in you is to stretch you. See, Barnum said it this way. He said, comfort is the enemy of progress. What'd you say? That was a minute ago, bud. A minute ago. Comfort is the enemy of progress. But I'm going to say it this way. Comfort is the enemy of your purpose. Comfort is the enemy of your purpose. See, there is, there is a potential in your life that God is trying to extract from you, but the only way that he can do that is to be, to put you in situations that pull out in you what you've been sitting on. Some of you, you're sitting on what you've been given. And God's saying, it's time to work for it. It's time to come out. It's time to be uncomfortable. It's time to be. Jesus said it this way. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are, oh man. Everybody wants a big harvest. Ain't nobody want to work for it. Everybody wants to come out on top, but most of us want to do the least amount of work as possible. God says, man, if you want to discover what I'm calling you to, if you want to find your purpose in your life, then you have to be stretched. You got to be uncomfortable. Can, can I say it this way to you? Listen, if you want your kids to have big faith, their big faith is not dependent upon your kid's pastor, your student pastor. It's dependent on their parents who are the pastor. See, the level of their faith is only as deep as the level of your faith. And if you think that just showing up on a Sunday and dropping your kids at your kids, at kids church is the way that it's going to grow them, then you have, you have misunderstood what faith is about. Because your kids are watching you. Which means at times in your life, you're going to have to be inconvenienced. Which at times in your life, if you want to grow your faith, you're going to have to do things that are really uncomfortable for you because in order to grow them, you have to be. You're getting there. Sometimes in our jobs, it's like, they ain't paying me enough. I, I deserve that promotion. I need more money. Well, maybe you should just perform under pressure. Like, you're so busy talking about your paycheck, yet you haven't even performed yet. And in the middle, why God is trying to push you and stretch you, you're just worried about the pay and the compensation. See, sometimes in your job, you have to go through really hard things in order to get where God wants to take you. Sometimes in your job, you have to be. In our relationships, some of us have really unhealthy relationships. And the way that you get from unhealthy relationships to healthy relationships is to give up the unhealthy ones that you have, but it may mean going through a season where you don't have friends. Sometimes you have to go through the desert and loneliness. Sometimes you have to go through the desert and depression, but maybe that's the moment where God wants to stretch you. You know what, at Be Hope we say this, every weekend is a great weekend to come to church. Glad you figured that out. Every weekend is a great weekend to come to Be Hope. 
And uh, one of the things that you're really good at is you're good at inviting people. We believe that the invite is so important that all you have to do is extend a card to somebody else and say, come to church with me because it's going to be a great weekend. But have you ever thought about how uncomfortable it is to hand somebody an invite card when you barely even know them? Like, have you ever, have you done this? Like, you go to the store and you're like, I really want to do this. God, give me the courage. I'm really uncomfortable. And you, you hey, I go to this, this, this church. You, no, 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 no. See, some of you are just like, you're so bold and you're so comfortable. You're just like, come with me to church. And what do you do when you invite? You what? You you stretch. Oh, this is so powerful. You stretch. See, what I know for you is that God may be trying to stretch you in this moment. And instead of giving him thanks, we want to complain about the discomfort. Can I let you know right now, this is the moment where we give God praise for the problems in our lives. This is the moment where we give God praise because he's stretching us. Let, let, let me show you how this works. God, I'm giving you praise right now because I can't see the solution ahead of me. Come on, let's go. I'm giving you praise right now because I'm in over my head. I'm giving you praise right now because I can't see what's in front of me. I'm giving you praise because I've got problems. I'm giving you praise because it's difficult. I'm giving you praise because it's hard. I'm giving you praise because of my insecurity. But I know that it's your insurance, that it's your calling on my life in this moment. Because if I could do it on my own power, I would think that I did it and not you doing it through me. And so in this moment, I'm going to give you praise because you're stretching me. You're using me. You're putting these circumstances circumstances in my life so that I can uncover the gifts and the passion and the purpose that you have for my life. God, I'm going to give you praise. I'm going to give you praise. There you are. So we, we know that we want to leave a legacy, church. That's what we're called to do. We know that sometimes we have gifts and skills that God has put in our lives that we are, we're just sitting on them. And so I love what it says in verse 37, 36 and 37. It says, which of the three, this is Jesus asking the expert, which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy. Don't you love how the expert doesn't directly answer Jesus' question. I think Jesus was looking for the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which one? And he said, the one who had mercy. And what I love in this story is that I think the innkeeper is the one who had mercy. Let me put it this way. The ones who are willing to be stretched in this world are the ones who are gonna make all the difference. The ones who make the greatest impact in the world. When you look at world leaders and when you look at people that have made a difference, they were always willing to be stretched. And in the story, it says the one who had mercy. I want you to know on the receiving end, mercy is receiving what we don't deserve. But on the giving end, but on the other side of it, Mercy is giving beyond our capacity. Mercy is giving beyond what we are capable of. And when I look at the story, notice the shift. He's saying, hey, I need you to medically take care of this guy. But in the process, he says, oh, by the way, I'm leaving, and you may have to pay a little bit more money, and I don't know if you can afford it, but I'll come back and reimburse you. Listen, in this day, they didn't have collateral. It's not like he said, take my driver's license. Hey, I'll give you my three camels and I'll come back and you can have those. No, no, no. In this moment, he has no clue, no clue if this Samaritan's ever coming back again. And in this moment, he is paying out, he is forking out finances that he's not even sure that he can afford. Can I let you know in this day, these people were paying over 22% in taxes. You think you pay a lot of taxes paying 22% in taxes. And he's stretched. 
because he, don't know, he doesn't know if he can afford it. And what I know is that, that the innkeeper lands himself in the story is, is because he decided to leave something that was beyond him. He decided to invest in somebody's life. He decided to pour into somebody's life. He was giving beyond what he was capable of because he was willing to be stretched in his faith. Can, can I let you know, Be Hope? I, I get to see and witness, I get to see and witness people every day who invest in the lives of others and they give beyond what they are capable of. I have a, I have a friend named Matt Markman and he was in our last service at 9 a.m. And Matt would text me on Monday, by the way, Matt is my running buddy. I don't know if you have running buddies, but they're not really your good friends. And so on Monday morning, uh, he, will, he will text me and say, you want to run tomorrow? Not really. <laughs> you? Yeah, I'm ready to go. No. So every Monday and, and Wednesday, I get a text from him saying, let's run tomorrow, 5.30 a.m. I'm like, dude, it's cold out. I like my covers. Matt also is nine years younger than I am. And so uh, I'm always sucking wind trying to keep up with him. And so when we run, like it's exhausting. What I find is that he is stretching me in my fitness, which I am oh so grateful for. But what I am more grateful for in the moment is that I get to see him, oh, I get to see him stretching in his faith. See, I'm always stuck in wind and so I can't talk. And so he talks the whole time, which I'm grateful for. But, but he, said, he said this to me the other day. He said, uh, he said a year and a half ago, he said, I would just come to church and I'd sit in a pew. And I would go home and I'd feel disconnected. I feel like my faith wasn't growing. And I was like, that's it. That's it. Can I tell you church, the pew is not your passion. The pew is just a starting point. And so he realized, I don't wanna stay here in this place. And so he decided, oh, I'll join Hope Unleashed. He gets in Hope Unleashed. And next thing you know, uh, he, is, he is serving on a Hope team. I want you to know Matt serves, Matt serves as one of our student ministry Be Hope leaders. Can we give it up for all of our leaders who lead our students? I want you to know we have an amazing, an amazing youth group. I love, I love that our kids love coming. My boys did not want to come pick us up at the airport because they wanted to come to church instead. You guys are so mean. But Matt said, he said, man, like, they're saying things to me. I don't even know what they're saying. Like they're using phrases and words and I don't know if they're, they're like making fun of me or if they're telling jokes, but they're also asking questions about my faith and I don't, I don't know what to do with it. And he said, man, if I lived in, 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 they, in their day and in their life the way I did, did back then, he said, man, I would, be, I would be so lost. I don't even know what to do with them. But Matt shows up every week and he keeps leading, he keeps coaching, he keeps loving, he keeps reading scripture to these students. And then he said, I love serving, but I also want to be in part of this new thing called Hope Discovered. He's one of the early adopters. I love early adopters. You guys are my favorite. The 10 percenters, the ones who are like, I don't care. I don't even have to know. Just sign me up. That's him. And there was a guy a couple months ago that just got baptized. And Matt said, you know what? I'll go through Hope Discovered and I'm going to walk this guy in his faith. And as we were running the other day, he said to me, he said, Brett, I have never been more passionate and excited in my life. He said, it's not about my job. It's not about my paycheck. It's not about my salary. It's not about my house. He said, what I've realized is that my purpose in this life is to lead other people in their faith so they can discover the hope of Jesus in their life. I want you to know, church, your hope was meant to be unleashed. Your hope was meant to be unleashed. Your purpose in this life is simply to point other people to God. That is your all purpose. Jesus said it this way. He said, go and make disciples. Go and that's it. And it's the one thing in our lives that we've struggled to do. It's the one thing in the church that we still haven't figured out. But I know this, that when we discover that a whole purpose is to lead people forward in their faith, there's a movement that begins to take place. And you're wondering, how do I do that? You got to become a first church champion. Matt is a first church champion because he is investing spiritually in the lives of other people. And you're saying, yeah, yeah, but it's my first day here. Well, let me show you how it works at Be Hope. Congratulations, you're a first time guest. 
we love you. Like stepping into this place for the first time is the boldest step of faith you can make. And so today, church, can we celebrate everyone who is here for the first time? But you don't stop there, right? Because you're going to get bored at being a first-time guest. And so we say, hey, man, claim your identity in your life. Go through this thing called Hope Unleashed. It's a three-week crash course. Three weeks, that's it. Because here's the reality. You cannot help somebody find their identity if you don't even know yours. Stop trying to help people when you need to help yourself first. It's like the oxygen mask on a plane comes down. Don't put it on them. You put it on you. Claim your identity. Get on a hope team. Like, you need to be stretched. Some of you are like, I did the Hope Unleashed thing. Yeah, I know my identity. Now what? Stretch yourself. Stretch yourself in this moment. Like, like join a hope team where you will find belonging and you will clarify your purpose. You feel disconnected? Join a hope team. You'll get to know people. You'll share stories. And you'll start serving. See, serving on Sunday is practice for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I want you to look out there like you look in here. And you look really good in here. This is what I get most passionate about. People keep saying, Brad, what's the next step after that? And Hope Discovered is not a class. It is not a checklist. But Hope Discovered is where you gain the tools to lead other people in faith. Uh, people say like, that's it. Like, I just got to do these four steps. It's this trajectory. And then I'm a first church champion. Listen, if you think your faith is a trajectory, you've missed the point. The church is not a trajectory. The church is a movement. And so when you go through these things and you realize now I'm a first church champion, you have not arrived because you have to go back to the beginning where the new first time guest comes in and say, I know you're new here and I know this is a new experience with you. Let me walk you through this. And guess what? I know you just came out of the baptismal and you're new in your faith, but let me walk you through this. I know that you just gave your life to Jesus and it's the first time experience for you of what he's like and what he can do. But let me walk you through this church. See, our calling in this life is not a trajectory, but it is a movement that begins to happen within this church in such a way that each one of us is investing spiritually in the life of someone else. And can I tell you, the change that we will see, the growth that we will see, the lives that we will see that will rise up and share about a God who has changed them forever will forever, forever change eternity. It will leave a legacy. There's, a, there's an old prayer that says this, God, clothe me, clothe me in your spirit so that reaching forth my hands in love, I might reach those who do not know you and bring them to the knowledge and love of you. What he's saying is, make me a first church champion. Use me, God. Use me to walk somebody else in their faith. But that only comes from your understanding of who God is. See, the first part of the prayer says this. It says, God, you, you stretched. God, you stretched your arms upon the hardwood of the cross so that all might come to the reach of your saving embrace. The only way that your life could be reached is because God decided to stretch himself. Jesus said, he said, God, take this cup from me. It's not that I don't want to do it. I just know the discomfort that's ahead, but I still believe I'll go through the discomfort because you are worthy of my grace. And so Jesus stretched his arms on the hardwood of the cross so he could reach into the darkness of your life. Jesus stretched his arms upon the cross so he could reach into the depression of your life. Jesus stretched so he could reach the sin of your life. Jesus stretched so he could reach the hurt of your life. Jesus stretched so he could reach the identity that you needed to know that you are good and beautiful and you can be used for a purpose and a reason and you have a calling in this life. See, our God stretched his arms upon the cross so that he could reach you with the grace and the mercy and the love that you are deserving of and your life will never be the same because of a church would you stand with me in this moment we're going to do two things I want to pray this prayer with you 
because some of you need to know that God loves you and today your life needs to change. God is reaching out for you today and saying, leave a legacy, but it starts with me. So we're gonna pray this prayer and we're gonna sing a song. And I know some of us, like we wanna dip out and we wanna get away so we can drive away because we're hungry right now. I'm hungry too. I've been, here, been up since 4 a.m. I'm hungry too. But in this moment, we sing a song as a response to what God can do in our lives. We're gonna sing a song that says, when I sing and shout, your victory comes out. You have given me authority. Today, receive that grace. Let's pray this together, church. Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, that he gave his life to forgive my sins. And he was raised from the grave so that I might have life. Oh, I receive your grace by faith. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. Amen. Come on. Let's celebrate everyone who has made that decision today. Come on, church.